fellow listeners, and welcome to the Monta Weekly Podcast, bringing you energy matters in an informal setting. This week's pod takes a closer look at Italy and the role gas will play as the country looks to move from pipeline gas to LNG amid a backdrop of decarbonisation. As it has weaned itself off Russian pipe gas, would Italy risk locking into a dependence on LNG? And what is the outlook for gas demand in the country? Has Italy also managed to speed up some of its permitting processes in order to build new gas infrastructure? We have divided this special episode into two parts. In the first, joining me, Richard Sverson, is Stefano Venier, CEO of SNAM, Italy's gas transit operator. A warm welcome to you, Stefano. Uh, good morning to everyone. Um, Stefano, let's start off by talking about uh, the situation we find ourselves these days. There's sort of lots of geopolitical concerns. Um, but at the same time, we've had two very mild winters. Gas storage is fairly full. LNG has saved the day. Where Are we out of the energy crisis, would you say, Stefano? Well, I think I think we are still in a very fragile situation. I mean, definitely we are... We have overcome, we eased the, let's say, the tension and the crisis we lived into in 2022 and first part of 2023, thanks to the actions that has been undertaken along of the last 24 months. Of course, uh, we eased uh, the crisis, uh, but I think that generally speaking, we are not in a situation that put us in a safe position in the sense that... Uh, of course, we are now relying more, much more on LNG, but the LNG market is a global market, uh, is a market with uh, uh, two, three parts of the world that has very high demand, especially in Asia. Demand is growing very fastly. Therefore, uh, I mean, uh, the balancing between the liquefaction capacity and regas capacity is very tight. So going forward, since the, we don't have, at least in the next couple of years, uh, sizable capacity coming on stream, I think uh, the situation will be pretty tight. Of course, much will depend on the growth of demand in Asia rather than in Europe, uh, and that is one point. On the other side, I think the ge geopolitical crisis that is spreading across the world, of course, uh, can have a certain influence. We haven't seen clear implications from the Middle East crisis in the short term, and not even from the uh, closing of the uh, Suez Channel. But I think uh, this situation might delay certain investment decision in that area that in the future could play a significant role in the balancing, especially of Europe. And that is a point we have to bear in mind. You mentioned um, so LNG infrastructure, Stefano. What, what's the status at the moment of, of, of new capacity in Italy and how soon can that be brought online? I mean, two years ago, we we were in a situation where we were really dependent from gas, uh, Rus, uh, Russian gas supplies for almost forty percent of the global demand. At that time, we have we had a very limited LNG capacity due to the fact that Italy, differently from other European countries, has five interconnecting pipes from dif five different sources of gas, and that put us uh, in a very let's say resilient situation. Of course, with the, uh, let's say, curtailment of the Russian supplies, we had to look on a further diversification. And we received from the government the request to setting up uh, at least additional 10 BCM capacity on LNG. And we started buying two LNG vessels. The first one is already on stream since mid of last year. The second will be on stream beginning next year. At the end of this process, almost 40% of the Italian demand could be supplied with LNG. Last year, we reached the 25%. And the 40% is, I think, an appropriate balancing between the options we, we, ha we will have from uh, pipe supply and the options on LNG supply. So do, will, will Italy then depend on, on spot LNG or will it sign long-term contracts? Um... What's the outlook there, Stefano? Well, I think I think uh, the majority of the supply will be on long-term contracts, and I'll tell you why. When we made, we sold the capacity of the first LNG vessel, the one that is located in Tuscany. We sold it uh, for ninety percent for twenty years. So those who bought that capacity for twenty years means they have a portfolio of contracts that cover that period, and so I think. Uh, 
uh, all that capacity will be used in the long run, short term and long run uh, on the basis of long term supply contracts. And uh, we do expect uh, a similar situation for, for the second vessel. I think uh, the reason why is because we have two, three large players in the country, starting from ENI, but as well as Edison and NL, that has a portfolio of long term contracts. Uh, a large part of this portfolio is based on, on uh, LNG, and that, of course, uh, induces uh, this sort of strategy. Finally, ENI, as you know, is a large uh, oil and gas company that has that owns uh, large amounts of equity gas. Therefore, uh, they have the optionality to rely on, let's say, uh, contracts uh, um, with uh, some large suppliers like Qatar or other countries, plus the equity gas they have specifically in the uh, in Africa. I mean. I think that that's all absolutely very interesting. I think, um, but if you set it against the 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 ambitions that Italy has to to, to decarbonize, um, you know, its economy, not just its energy sector, is there a risk that Italy could lock itself into kind of an LNG future here uh, into the next sort of ten twenty years? Uh, I don't think so. I think uh, the uh, there is one core element that will allow or will easy the transition. That is uh, flexibility in the infrastructure. So the great opportunity we can have in this transition pathway comes from the North Africa, okay, and the possible production of green hydrogen in those countries. To ship the, that hydrogen, of course, the pipeline is the most suitable way and the most effective way Therefore, if we use part of the pipeline infrastructure to ship uh, in the future hydrogen, we, uh, let's say, consequently reduce the capacity for grass transportation that has to be supplied via LNG. So you have a sort of complementarity between the two means. And here comes, I think, uh, the, the great opportunity the country has to play a role not only within uh, uh, its own uh, uh, boundaries, but also for the rest of Europe. And in there falls uh, uh, the PCI project uh, called South H2 Corridor that aims to connect uh, North Africa, Algeria, Tunisia, and Libya to the central part of Europe. And uh, for deploying that project, uh, we will uh, devote one of the three pipes that goes from south to north exactly to ship uh, hydrogen as a first step, then consequently on how the consumption will evolve on both uh, molecules, I mean hydrogen and, and natural gas, uh, we, will, we will retain the flexibility to repurpose a second pipe. I, I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to turn to hydrogen uh, in a moment, uh, Stefano, but before we get to that, let's talk about a little bit about domestic demand in Italy. It obviously took a, a big hit uh, in in the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, but also in the energy crisis. Um, what's the status now and uh, what what does it look like into 2025 and beyond? I think we had a very, uh, let's say, a, a strong hit, as you said, uh, in the last couple of years. And uh, the reason behind that hit are pretty different, uh, let me say. On one side, uh, the, uh, let's say, restrictions that has been induced by the European Commission had a certain effect on, on domestic consumption. Uh, the level of prices, of course, had certain implications on the industrial consumption at the same time. And the third, the recovery of the nuclear production in France, specifically for, for, for Italy, had uh, as a consequence the reduction of the thermal gen domestic thermal generation. I think part of this uh, effects uh, will be overcome over the next two to three years, but part will remain. In terms of expectations, uh, I think uh, uh, for 2024, we do expect consumption in line with last year or slightly above. And for the next year, of course, uh, an additional let's say, stabilization on that level. Of course, for 2030, there will be a further reduction as a consequence of the deployment of the renewable production, but not as much as we might 
uh, let's say, figure out looking at 2021 consumption. I think a large part of that reduction has been already achieved in the last couple of years. So to say numbers, uh, uh, if in 2021 we had more than 70 BCM of consumption, uh, last year we had 62, 63. What we do expect for 2030 is something around 58. And for 2040, something around 50, 45. So it's, of course, it is a reduction, but is not as dramatic as someone might, uh, might figure out or was expected a couple of years ago. And that has, of course, another uh, implication in the sense that more and more gas is taking the role of the transition fuel for the uh, toward decarbon neutrality. And that, that reduction, where's that happening? Is that happening in industry or, or in the sort of household business uh, segment? I think, I think uh, first uh, on thermal generation and, se and second domestic production. Because when I say industrial consumptions, I primarily refer to our to bait industries uh, that are those who cannot be electrified and therefore they have to use molecules for their processes and that can decarbonize uh, on two, let's say, uh, simple ways. On one side, they might capture the CO2 or they substitute the, uh, let's say, natural fossil natural gas with the green molecules like hydrogen or a blend of the two. Um, I'd like to turn to storage, uh, Stefano. And um, stocks seem to be fairly fairly robust after the winter. Um, uh, where are we now? Are, are, we, are we out of the woods the winter? The storage is, is decent. Um, that, it's all good news, is it? Yeah, it is a good news. I mean, we work uh, hardly to keep the gas in the storage. In the short, in the short I will come back to that. Uh, I think uh, there is one core point that has been understood in the last two years. I mean, the role of storage is not only to fulfill the peak in demand during winter, but has a strategic role to, let's say, smooth the volatility in the gas prices. And that was clear also a few months ago when we had the Middle East crisis. We, we saw the price not reflecting in any way the, let's say, the possible implications or, let's say, the speculation on the consequences of that situation because we had... The, large amounts of gas in the storages available all across Europe, okay? So uh, on one side, uh, keeping uh, gas in the storages also at the end of the winter season, like in these weeks, uh, has two implications. I mean, uh, smooth the volatility and make easier the uh, summer fulfillment and the opportunity to reach the 99% uh, uh, let's say uh, storage levels by the summer uh, by the end of the summer period, putting the different countries in a very favorable position also to tackle with uh, let's say unexpected events. In terms of regulation for storage, are any are any changes you'd like to see here, or are you happy with with the current situation? I mean, we did we did a lot of work with the authority. I mean, we introduced. Uh, uh, several several different, uh, let's say, optionalities in terms of flexibility. We now have set up uh, intraday auctions for capacity. We developed and was one of the reasons why we could, uh, let's say, keep uh, such a, a high level in the storages this winter, the reverse flow. So we re-inject during winter gas to maintain offering this optionality to the traders and shippers uh, that like to, let's say, inject the gas for the next uh, winter. And these kind of services, uh, of course, uh, made uh, the storage uh, uh, much more, let's say, attractive in the strategies of, of traders and shippers, uh, not losing the role that storages has, as I mentioned before. In, in terms of pipelines, uh, Stefano, um, you know, a, a section of the pipeline on the Adriatic coast will need to be built between Abruzzo and Emilia-Romagna to, to allow a increased flow from these two regions of Italy. 
Um, when will that building construction work start, and and um, how much transport will that allow you to add to the system? Uh, thanks to the fact that this uh, pipeline has been deemed uh, strategic for the European security, not only for Italian security, we had a sort of shortcut in the authorization steps, and that uh, uh, will let us to, let's say, open the first site works by next May, in two months. Uh, and uh, we have to end up uh, uh, the first, the step one in the development by mid of 2026 uh, uh, to be consistent with the repower EU schedule, whilst the second part will be completed just uh, one year after. So by the end of 2027, this new backbone that is for more than 400 meter long, uh, 400 kilometer long, uh, will be available, tripling the corridors from south to north and increasing from 125 million cubic meter per day to 150 million cubic meter per day, providing additional flexibility for the southern flows. But as I said before, also the flexibility that will be, let's say, will represent an advantage in the repurposing process for shipping the hydrogen. Absolutely. I mean, I think uh, that that's quite a substantial addition. Um, and and it, from what you're saying, Stefano, it seems that, um, it, you know, you managed to fa fast track some of the permitting process to get that into place and to allow for a building to start in May. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, the fact that, as I said, the fact that this was deemed as a strategic infrastructure for the energy security for Europe allowed us to have a sort of fast track. Of course, doing all the jobs we usually do in the permitting process, but uh, with, let's say, an accelerating, accelerated uh, approval process. And that happened also for the two floating vessels in where we had the, a specifically commissioner that completed the authorization process in 120 days. That is a record, and this record allowed us to put on, on in operation the first vessel within an year. I'm sure some renewables um, developers would be very envious of, of the fact that that can be done so quickly, Stefano. But uh, uh, let's move on to hydrogen. Um, I, I, you know, I think um, I'm just like to. We've seen certain projects across Europe put on ice, delayed. Is there still that enthusiasm there? Is, is there, I mean, I've, I've talked to you guys before about green hydrogen. Are you still very enthusiastic about it? Do you see that it makes economic sense? I think more than enthusiastic, I'm pragmatic in the sense that uh, we need to have these green molecules, uh, but to get these green molecules, we need to build up an entire market from designing the market, setting the rules, uh, preparing the infrastructure and, of course, developing the production and consumption. That is not something you can do in one day, and uh, it requires some time. Of course, uh, in some cases, you might have uh, some advantages in terms of time to market, and I'm referring to the fact that, for instance, for the outage to corridor, we can leverage upon on the fact that more than 50% of this infrastructure can be repurposed from existing gas pipelines. That is, of course, a, a, an advantage that can uh, shorten the, the time required for having this transportation in, on stream. But of course, it takes some time and we need also to develop uh, the adequate uh, a scale for this production to get to a competitive production cost. That is a prerequisite because at the end of the day, at the end of this transition, we need to have plenty of energy available, decarbonized, but the competitive cost. Otherwise, uh, we will keep on subsidizing this new energy at the cost of the final customers. That is not something that we can afford for a long time. So I think uh, uh, I'm not surprised that uh, this kind of solution is taking a bit more time. But at the same time, uh, I see a window opportunity for other options uh, that are available, like the carbon capture, the CO2 uh, capture, that is definitely a solution for power generation and r 2 abate industries that can help to fulfill the time frame within bridging, the time frame between now and when the hydro competitive hydrogen will be available. 
I think uh, we now are going through um, a situation in where everyone is getting aware about the fact, two major facts. The first one, we don't have a silver bullet that solve all the, soli that solve all the problems in the transition. And second, that each country across Europe has to find the best mix of technologies for leading this uh, journey to net zero. Absolutely. I mean, just a, a final question, Stefano, on the, on the physics, maybe the engineering side. I'm, I'm certainly no expert, but is it, is, is it a straightforward matter substituting natural gas uh, for green hydrogen in the, in the gas infrastructure here and in the pipelines? Just you, you change from, from gas to hydrogen. Does there need to be some mixing? Does there need to be modifications to the pipelines? What needs to happen for, in order for that to happen? You, can, you can't play on off. You need to prepare the infrastructure. You need, of course, to make some, uh, some intervents, uh, given the fact that the molecule of hydrogen is much thinner and smaller than the CH4, and therefore you need to prepare certain parts of the pipeline. Of course, the core of the pipeline that is made of steel, you just need to have it in the right material, in the right kind of steel. But where you have the junctions, where you have the compressing units, of course, you need to, let's say, let me say in a very simple words, reinforce uh, uh, the, let's say, imp and the, the impermeability of those infrastructure. And that is, I think, the, 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 the job we have to do uh, when we redevote uh, uh, and re repurpose those infrastructure for, for hydrogen. And that's the reason why uh, I see also a, a, another uh, good opportunity in blending hydrogen with gas uh, because it, to that extent uh, you can kick off uh, this, the production of hydrogen without having the barrier of large investment for the transportation. So there, are, there is a mix of optionalities we need to play with uh, to make uh, this journey as much competitive as possible. Stefano. Very interesting indeed. I think the, the future that we certainly is very exciting. There won't be many boring parts of the uh, as we go forward into the new uh, energy future. So thanks again, Stefano. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to you, Richard, and to all the, the audience. And in the second part of this episode, we talk to Massimo Nicolazzi of the University of Turin. A warm welcome to you, Massimo. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Perfect. Um, Massimo, can you, can you tell me a little bit first? I mean, we've, we've had the COVID crisis and the energy crisis. Um, are, are we out of the woods? Uh, who knows? We thought we were out of the woods when the, the COVID crisis seemed to be over and we won a war just thereafter. Uh, so I, I, I suppose nobody can predict what, what's coming next. You, you, you plan business as usual, hoping it is as usual. You can ask no more. And that's Absolutely. Right. No. So, um, no, I mean, uh, you have uh, today Gaza, you have today the UT, you still have the war in Ukraine. Uh, what could be comfortable, I don't know for how long, is that in the midst of this mess, uh, gas uh, TTF on the European market was around 30 this morning. Uh, Brent uh, stood uh, below 90. So basically there is an indication that there are enough resources on offer to survive the crisis if it doesn't get worse. Exactly. That's the big if. Um, but uh, in, in terms of gas prices now, um, they, they have sort of normalized. You mentioned 30 euros yeah. compared to they're much lower than they were you know, just uh, a year ago. Um, do you, would you say they've normalized now? That uh, What can we expect over the coming weeks and months? Um, I mean, net of the unexpected, what you see when you look uh, at futures quotations and the forward quotation is that uh, the market uh, is more or less believing that it could be stabilizing around today prices. Whether this is going to prove true or not will depend on a number of factors concerning next year, basically, next winter, basically. But uh, there we will see, there will be the test. But we've been very lucky. We've had two very mild winters in a row. Absolutely, but next winter, I mean, uh, if I look at uh, the new liquefaction capacity coming on stream in the next two or three years, 
and the new regas capacity coming on stream, for example, in Europe in the next few years. Uh, I think next year is the last potentially troublesome one okay. in terms of uh, availability of supply. And, and this is going to be predicated on two factors, uh, one of which is weather, <laughs> and, and the other one is China. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay. So what you think Chinese LNG demand is a crucial factor here, of course, as well as uh, potentially uh, cold weather? They, they go together. They, they go together. I mean, if, uh, if Chinese demand uh, remains at medium levels and we get a decent winter, uh, you can have the prices stabilized. But many things may happen in between. I mean... Uh, I think these last few years have uh, kind of advised us not to make medium long term predictions. Exactly. Certainly, the the recent the recent uh, experience uh, tells us that. But how, um, in terms of, you know, Italy was very dependent on Russian gas. It's now it now needs to turn to LNG. Uh, is it locking itself into to the, to an LNG future here for the coming uh, years or decades? I think everybody does. I mean, Italy has uh, tried to answer the crisis uh, via pipelines by increasing imports from Algeria. Uh, we have uh, a new liquefaction capacity moved in Livorno. Another one is coming in the Adriatic Sea next year, etc., etc., etc. Do we need more? You see, there is a sort of conflict there in terms of our policy statements between derussification and decarbonization. Because basically, by five or six years, we should be able to decrease our consumption of natural gas, according to Brussels, uh, of volumes which are more or less equivalent to the volumes we were importing from Russia. Would you build a new pipeline in a situation like that? You, you may never be able to amortize it. To the extent that you install floating facilities and China is serious in doubling its consumption while we are saying we are going to halve ours, someone that floats may be sold elsewhere. A fixed pipeline cannot change that action. But uh, so the answer is there floating LNG, you're saying, and certainly uh, do you, we've seen a number of them being built uh, at Northern Europe, some in Southern Europe, but will, is there a danger that these could be under underutilized? Uh, not for uh, for the time being. Uh, if we grow more, uh, the answer may change. In Italy, we are talking about uh, doing uh, the two onshore thirty years old project uh, of regas facilities, one in Sicily and and the other in Gioia Tauro. I think these are going to be grossly underutilized if we build them. Okay, yeah, no, that's interesting. So, I mean, as 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 part of the move to to net zero, part of the energy transition, or just that they, you know, that Italy doesn't have the demand for the gas anymore. Well, demand will also be a test for next year. What we know now is that in the last two years, our internal consumption decreased from around seventy four to slightly more than 61 billion cubic meters a year. Uh, where it's going to stand the next year is going to answer your question, because this has to stabilize as well. Uh, one issue with that is that part of it is gas for industrial production. Uh, the FT uh, published a piece a couple of days ago saying uh, uh, industrial consumption uh, of gas uh, will be restored between 20 in 2027 or something like that, I seriously doubt it. Because if I look at the decrease, the decrease is more or less concentrated mostly in steel, in chemical, and in paper, which are three, sec three sectors as, as to which you have in Europe a, a competitive question, so to speak. So the decrease could be out... Uh, of competitive factors and not only of the price of gas. Is that where something like the CBAM comes in, the the, the carbon border tax that's making these companies uh, um, um, uncompetitive, or, or other factors like moving to the US or other parts no, of the world? No, I think it's an old story, you know, of the difficulty of the steel industry in Europe. Uh, we are just 
slightly worse off than the American industry on that, talking about Pittsburgh. So that, this is structural. Chemical. What is the future of chemical with shale gas and that cheap in the States? Uh, are you going to be able to survive in competition in petrochemicals uh, with uh, oil made uh, uh, European ethylene? No way. So this drop in demand is more permanent. Is that what you're saying, Massimo? The, 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 the industry beat, uh, I am uh, pessimistic as to the potential for recovery. Some is going to be recovered, but not the whole of it. That the crucial factor will be the reaction uh, of domestic consumption to next winter. I mean, um, uh, have we been saving something or it was just too warm <laughs> to light it up? Yeah, absolutely. This, but This is something we will understand better next winter, I believe. So that, that's, that's, uh, that's a very interesting perspective because as, as, as prices are falling, you'd expect maybe demand to pick up as well, especially both in the household and, and the industrial uh, sectors. I expect next year, this year, to go above 61, so to speak, uh, if it is not as warm as last year was. Uh, some billion of industrial consumption, we are probably not going to be able to recover soon. Mm. That's very interesting. And I think, you know, people are talking about uh, green hydrogen being a stimulus and, and for, for certain parts of the industry, especially for green steel. But you don't, do you see that uh, as being a factor here, moving from natural gas to maybe grey hydrogen, green hydrogen? Is that green hydrogen is something that then in intimity I call good all normally. Even in the most aggressive scenario, we will have to wait for the second half of the next decade to have a material and substantial possibility of producing green hydro hydrogen. And I'm talking about the most aggressive scenarios I've seen so far. So uh, if you need hydrogen in the meantime, uh, pick up a different color, make it orange, white, uh, uh, whatever. Uh, but green for a while will, will stay as good. Old. Okay, so absolutely. So there, you're saying that's a long way off, I think. Um, there has been, we, we talked a little bit about LNG. Now, there, there is uh, a talk within some uh, European member states of, of basically prohibiting the use of Russian LNG. Where, where do you stand on that? Well, this is an interesting story because uh, historically, uh, the only Commodity production we haven't sanctioned coming from Russia is gas. Russian gas has dropped by explosion and not by sanction, so to speak, because it was never sanctioned. And it is not sanctioned yet, and uh, behind uh, official speeches and the like, uh, I think even in Brussels they are scared that for another year at least uh, they are going to need some. Yeah. Uh, if this is so, we will probably sanction Russian LNG when we are sure that enough liquefaction has been completed some elsewhere. Okay. Yeah. So we need to be on the safe side before that happens. I, I'm, I'm not saying we need to be. I'm saying, uh, I mean, uh, Brussels uh, has shouted many times that they were going to sanction everything, but they never sanctioned gas. They have helped increasing prices by announcing they would have sanctioned it, but they have not. Uh, are they going to feel enough on the safe side to change their attitude or not? I don't know. As far as the system is concerned, you may be doing without also LNG because, you know, the good thing about LNG is that it floats. It is not a fixed installation. Uh, so, same, you may project a scenario like the one in oil. It doesn't come here, it goes elsewhere. It is shipped. Huh? Pipeline gas goes uh, where the pipeline takes it. LNG goes where the price takes it. So, uh, if we sanction it, they're going to export uh, some elsewhere and we are going to import from somewhere. Uh, I, I think we can balance. 
the thing if if there is a political decision to go forward. Absolutely. You mentioned ships and, and a crucial element here is what's happening in the in the Red Sea. Uh some of the attacks do you do you see this? I mean, is there a, is there a danger of a wider escalation of the conflict, which could then also uh, cause uh, imports of LNG to 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 be drastically reduced? Well, the, the issue there basically is Qatar, but uh, uh, to the extent that the conflict means just the UT, I don't think. I mean, you could have. Uh, an increase of transportation cost uh, in the short term. Uh, but if the crisis remains uh, within the present perimeter, I do not expect uh, dramatic consequences on, on our ability to supply, to be supplied, and on Qatar's ability to supply. I mean, we've, we've discussed uh, on several previous episodes of this podcast about what could eventually happen if, if the Straits of Hormuz uh, were, were closed. Uh, what's your view here? We could find that it is a Chinese problem to start with. And, uh, and this would be an interesting finding uh, because it would mean uh, that uh, we have concentrated importers' interests uh, uh, in keeping the highway free. For sure. Um, I think I'd like to turn now to, to Italy and what's happening in this country, uh, Massimo. Um, there are... There are Still not many details out on the government's plan to become a gas hub uh, for Europe. Nearly half of the Italian uh, power production is, is gasified. Um, how do you see the energy transition playing out in Italy? Do you think gas will continue to play a big role in, in Italy's power generation going forward? Yes. Well, I mean, uh, I see for, for the first time a not sufficient acceleration, but an, an acceleration in 2023 in renewables installation. Uh, what is going to be the curve of gas for the future? I don't know. Uh, I would keep... Uh, for sure, we are going to need it long term for the capacity market <laughs> because we have no substitute for that for the time being. What is going to be the rate of decline uh, In, in, in other destinations, so to speak, is going to depend uh, from, from a number of factors. I mean, uh, uh, the, our resilience plan uh, is putting almost two billion in capital contributions uh, uh, to new biogas plants. Uh, we should uh, go for uh, doubling uh, our production from uh, intermittent renewables by the end of the decade, we'll have to see how much of that is matched. Uh, the, the only thing I say there is that the only form, even in uh, the age of digitalization, the only form of security we have been able to to build conceptually and uh, and in practice is redundancy. <laughs> uh, so let's keep our ability to be supplied of gas redundant, please. Then we may use it or we may not. We may use it or we may not. But the redundancy has been our own insurance in the last few decades in terms of our energy needs. Absolutely. And I think uh, you're right in terms of the, the backup in a, in a capacity mechanism or some kind of market of that sort is, is there certainly will be need. Um, and we see in other countries as well. So it may be better just to burn gas for a few hours every year um, uh, rather than, um, uh, you know, some other fuels. Any, anyway, Massimo, uh, a final really question. You know, there's a, there's a talk of uh, across Europe of a, of a nuclear renaissance. Sweden is looking at it again, you know, uh, France, the UK. Is this a... Poland, um, is this a, a solution for, for Italy? I know it's been talked about many times before. Yeah, I don't like talking about uh, solution. The carbonization is going to be a Russian salad of, of a number of ingredients. Uh, it, it depends on how you put it together, so to speak. If you ask me whether nuclear could play a role, uh, my, my answer is in principle yes, but let's see where we stand. Uh, today, oh, we can only build the third generation, whatever the press says. 
And uh, we are seeing what's happening in Inkle Point uh, and in Flammarion in terms of the increase uh, uh, of power price necessary to fund it. Uh, small modular reactors uh, may come uh, in the future. Uh, but basically, the, the, the Ansaldo Edison plan presented in Italy is for small modular reactors of third generation in turn until the, uh, the mid of the next decade. And then maybe we will have a fourth generation uh, with uh, some circular ability <laughs> to absorb, to reutilize waste. Uh, so yes, but let's try to plan it properly and let's try to see who is investing in what. Huh? Let's talk concrete projects uh, and, and, and not the theory uh, of nuclear uh, safeguarding us. Um, on theory, it is, it is very simple. On theory, it is very simple. Uh, uh, yeah. Nuclear, if you adopt it, is, is not something that you adopt uh, in opposition to renewables. You adopt it in opposition to hydrocarbons. You adopt it to the extent that you feel that with renewables alone, you are not going to get there and to deliver. Huh? If you accept this premise, then let's talk uh, concrete projects. Can't say fairer than that, Massimo. Thank you very much for being a, a guest on the week. Thanks for you. It was a real pleasure.